Nobody likes critical hits. They almost always feel unfair, and it's very frustrating to lose a game because your opponent randomly crit one of your Pokemon. If you polled 100 Pokemon players and asked them if they'd like it if critical hits were removed from the game, most of them would probably tell you how bad the tree textures are in Sword and Shield. They probably would also say yes. Now, I'm not here to tell you that critical hits don't suck. I fully agree that in their worst circumstances, they can seriously impede a player's enjoyment of the game. There are ways of preventing critical hits, but most of them are either too gimmicky, poorly distributed, or too situational to be widely useful, like the move Lucky Chant, or the abilities Shell and Battle Armor. Because they don't seem like something you can realistically stop, critical hits tend to feel unfair to a player, and for most people, the enjoyment you feel from winning a game thanks to a timely critical hit does not offset the frustration when the shoe is on the other foot. So why would I say that critical hits are a necessary element of Pokemon? Didn't I just say that crits suck and are unfun? Well, believe it or not, both things can be true. Just like a child who doesn't want to eat their vegetables, critical hits are a hard to swallow part of a balanced game. Before we talk about why that is though, I think it would be useful to discuss how critical hits have changed over the course of Pokemon's eight generations. When it comes to mechanics, generation one is just barely functional. There is so much overwhelmingly broken stuff in these games that whenever I learn about a new mechanic from Gen 1, I feel like I need to get off the internet for a few days. Critical hits are no exception. Critical hits in Generation 1 scale off your level in terms of how much damage they do. That means that a level 5 Pokemon landing a critical hit does 50% more damage, but a level 20 Pokemon does 80% more damage. In Generation 1, critical hits also ignore the attack drop from the burn status, as well as any stat stage modifiers including your own boosts. This means that you can actually do less damage with a critical hit in Generation 1. You might be wondering, how often do crits occur in Generation 1? And the answer is, it depends on the Pokemon's speed stat. The faster a Pokemon is, the more likely it is to crit in Generation 1. Also, due to a bug, raising a Pokemon's critical hit rate actually makes it less likely to crit. Overall, critical hits in Generation 1 are just a huge mess. In Generation 2, critical hits now always do double damage instead of a variable amount based on the level. They also now additionally ignore the effect of Light Screen and Reflect. There's also some unique calculations with the critical hits and ignoring stat boosts, but it's really complicated and not worth going into here. Importantly, starting with Generation 2, the probability of landing a critical hit without any modifiers is 1 out of 16. Generation 3 is the first version of the modern critical hit. It does double damage, has a probability of 1 16th of occurring, and ignores your own negative stat drops and the target's positive stat buffs. This version of the critical hit stays constant through generations 4 and 5, until... In generation 6, the damage a critical hit does was adjusted from double damage to 50% more damage. As a minor note, they also changed how enhanced critical hit rates work, though that isn't relevant for our video. Which leads us to our final change. In Generation 7, for the first time since Generation 2, the rate at which moves crit was changed. It was adjusted down from 1 in 16 to 1 in 24, a 50% decrease in frequency. What's especially interesting to me is that this change was very quiet. It wasn't even discovered until after Sun and Moon had been out for a while, and it was never publicly acknowledged. Generation 8 uses the exact same critical hit mechanics as Generation 7. The reason I wanted to go through this brief history of the critical hit is to ask you, what do you notice about how critical hits have changed over the years? What are the trends that stick out to you? For me, there's two key moments in the history that really stick out. First, the change in damage output from a crit in Generation 6. Taking crits from a 100% damage increase down to a 50% damage increase was a massive deal, and I think this change did what it set out to accomplish by making critical hits still impactful, but less likely to be outright game-losing. Second, the change in frequency in Generation 7 taking our rate of occurrence from 1 in 16 to 1 in 24. This drop from roughly 6% to about 4% might not sound like a big deal, but in actuality, because of how many attacks are used over the course of a battle, or a set, or a tournament, you can really feel the lower crit rate in generations 7 and 8. It's clear that Game Freak realized that critical hits were just too powerful. They did too much damage and they occurred too often. They responded by lowering the critical hit rate and decreasing the damage that critical hits did. But what's really interesting is actually what they didn't do. Why not just remove critical hits altogether? Well, what is it about critical hits that make them so unpleasant from a player perspective? 
In my opinion, it's that element of randomness. Losing because the opponent was better or because the game is difficult causes a very different emotional response from most gamers than losing to something that feels out of a player's control. When you lose a game to a low probability outcome, it's really easy to blame the game. This is especially apparent in a game like Pokemon, where numerous careful plays can be quickly undone with a single bad critical hit. It can be easy to think, why am I trying so hard to play this game when I can just lose to bad luck anyway? In my opinion, the reason Game Freak didn't take crits out of the game was because they deemed them necessary. But why would Game Freak think that critical hits are necessary? I'm sure many of you will respond with the easy answer, which is that Game Freak doesn't know how to balance Pokemon competitively. I actually felt this way for a long time, especially when thinking about Pokemon like Xerneas, Smeargle, Zacian, Incineroar, Rillaboom, Regieleki, Urshifu, Thunderous, Landorus. <sighs> The list goes on and on. I'm not going to pretend like Game Freak gets it right all the time. They definitely don't, and VGC players have to pay the price. I think the other side of this coin, though, is that the task of balancing everything that goes on in Pokemon is basically impossible. I think balancing the type chart alone is already a tall order. There's 18 different Pokemon types, each with unique relationships with the other types, and there's over 150 different possible dual types. When you factor in things like abilities, move pools, base stats, and specific interactions, it's a monumental task that realistically can never be perfectly balanced. The real thing that convinced me that I wasn't giving Game Freak enough credit was actually when I was working on my videos about if Pokemon could have three types and if Pokemon could learn five moves. What interested me about these videos was that each of these changes would massively upset the balance of Pokemon in an extremely unhealthy way, and that Game Freak actually experimented with some of these changes in the past and came to the same conclusion. So, while Pokemon is far from a perfect competitive game, I do think Game Freak deserves a little more credit than they typically get when it comes to balancing. Alright, but we still haven't gotten into the why of the question. Why is leaving critical hits in the game a good thing? Well, let's start with the smaller reasons and build our way up. First, a certain degree of randomness is a good thing in games. Not every game needs randomness. Chess, for example, is a game with no in-game randomness that, in my opinion, is perfect the way it is. Not every game can be chess though, and many video games have understood that in the right context, randomness can enhance rather than hurt a game's enjoyability. As a very basic example, games like Mario Kart and Mario Party are incredibly popular, but at least for a casual gamer, have a very large degree of randomness. In these games, although it sucks to get hit with a blue shell when you're in first, these RNG-based elements contribute a large factor of player enjoyment to the overall experience. One of the major upsides to adding randomness to a game is that it helps each gameplay experience feel unique, especially to casual players. It also creates tension, which in a series not exactly known for its difficulty can be refreshing. I actually think one of the best ways to understand this concept is by looking at Nuzlocks. Critical hits in Nuzlocks are especially devastating. Losing a treasured Pokemon to an unfortunate critical hit is rage-inducing, but consider what a Nuzlocke would be like without it. There would be no tension, no drama. It would be possible for all but the hardest games to know exactly what the outcome of each turn would be. I beat Emerald Kaizo, one of if not the single hardest Pokemon games to Nuzlocke, and a huge part of beating that game is making game plans that don't lose to critical hits or at least minimizing your exposure to them. Without them, the game would lose a huge portion of its difficulty. And this is a Pokemon game specifically designed to be as challenging as possible. Imagine how much easier the base games would be in comparison. This carries over to competitive Pokemon as well, both as a player and as a spectator. As a player, critical hits and variants in general are one of the ways to come back from a deficit. Falling behind in the early turns of a game can sometimes be game losing, but knowing that with some good plays and good luck, you can almost always come back, keeps players invested. If there were no luck, I think it's possible that matchups would be far more impactful in the outcome of a game, or that the first or second turn could determine the eventual winner. While there are many downsides to having luck be a factor in competitive Pokemon, one upside is that a game isn't over until it's over. I think the best way to understand this is with Monopoly. Have you ever played Monopoly and knew you couldn't win, but you can't leave because there's other people playing? It sucks to still technically be in a game, but to have no chance of winning. And without luck-based elements, this situation would likely become common in Pokemon. This is more or less the same reason these luck-based elements improve the spectator experience. For people who enjoy watching competitive Pokemon, matches are rarely dull. 
Because luck is a factor in the game, matches often have big swings or crucial moments that are, on occasion, the result of luck. Few things are worse for a competitive game than it being boring to watch, and removing luck from the game would lead to more optimized, surgical gameplay, which could be detrimental to the viewing experience. So we understand that critical hits might be necessary in the game, but what about the fact that they feel so random and luck-based? If you promise not to tell anyone, I'll let you in on a little secret. Critical hits are not as luck-based as they seem, and there's a lot you can do to make sure you get more critical hits than your opponent. I'm talking, of course, about human sac- I'm talking, of course, about how you get critical hits. Think about it this way. If your opponent feels threatened by your Pokemon, they're likely to protect or switch it out. If your opponent is protecting or switching, that means they aren't attacking you. And if they don't attack you, you cannot get critical hit. In other words, the more often you attack in a battle relative to your opponent, the more often critical hits occur. By using Pokemon that threaten your opponent, you force them to either take big damage from the threatening Pokemon, or try and reposition to get around it. Another very important tool players have is to ensure their team is faster than their opponents. Think about it this way. If you knock out your opponent's Pokemon before they attack, they can't critical hit you. One easy example here has to do with Zacian. Let's say you and I are playing, and we each only have Zacian left. I need two attacks to KO your Zacian and you only need one to KO mine. This is a great position for you. But what if your Zacian is slower? Now, rather than winning 100% of the time, you'll only win 96% of the time, which is the odds your Zacian gets crit by mine. Now, 96% is still good odds, but over the course of a match, how many turns are you risking critical hits? In competitive Pokemon, you play two or three games against each opponent. Over the course of a tournament, you can play as many as 18 best of three sets, which means between 36 and 54 games. If your team is consistently slower than your opponents, you're going to be risking a lot of 96% chances over the course of a run. Teams that are slower and focus too heavily on defense over offense are inherently weak to critical hits. One thing that a lot of players don't think about is how many turns a team takes to win a game. A team that takes 15 or 16 turns to win is going to have a lot more critical hits than a team that only takes 6 or 7 turns to win, simply because so many more attacks are going to be used. If you feel like you're a player who gets crit all the time, reflect on the types of teams you like to use, and pay specific advantage to if you have enough damage and speed control, and how many turns your games are taking. Now, I understand this doesn't really solve the issue. At the end of the day, even if critical hits are in many ways a reflection of a player's decisions in battle and when constructing their team, that isn't as important as the public perception of them. I think critical hits will always be perceived as luck-based and unfair, but at least viewers of my channel will now hopefully be less on the receiving end of them. So at this point in the video, I understand you may still be unconvinced. We've talked about how critical hits add excitement for spectators and keep players invested in games, and how critical hits are actually less luck-based than they appear. But we haven't actually proven that they're necessary yet. There are probably other solutions that could keep the game exciting and still be somewhat skill-based. So what is it about critical hits that makes them a necessary component of Pokemon? As usual, I've saved my strongest point for last. The reason I believe that critical hits are a necessary evil is because of one of the lesser talked about secondary effects. Critical hits ignore your opponent's defensive buffs. We touched a bit on this earlier, but just as a reminder, while the primary effect of a critical hit is to do 50% more damage, it also ignores your negative boost to your attack stats and your opponent's positive boost to their defense stats. Critical hits are one of the single best tools at keeping incredibly defensive Pokemon from simply running away with the metagame. Many players like to play defensive setup Pokemon and turn naturally bulky Pokemon into defensive nightmares, then win the game via a war of attrition. One of the best examples of this is Tapu Fini. Tapu Fini has incredibly good typing and phenomenal natural bulk. There have been formats where many players use Tapu Fini with Calm Mind and Leftovers and paired it with Intimidate, Fake Out, Reflect, and Light Screen support. Players would bolster their defenses significantly, set up three or four Calm Minds, and then attempt to win the game from there. Playing against teams like this is incredibly frustrating. Your attacks do no damage, there's so much disruption, and in a worst case scenario, you end up in a situation where you just can't do anything as you're slowly choked out. To make matters worse, these games tend to take a long time because of the amount of bulk and recovery, so you can easily get stuck in what feels like an unwinnable situation for 10 or more minutes. 
one of if not the single greatest weakness of these teams has to do with the pace at which they play the game because they spend multiple turns shoring up their defenses and setting up they aren't attacking or threatening any damage that means that every turn they're likely taking multiple attacks which means as we talked about earlier this strategy is extremely susceptible to critical hits while players using this strategy may just consider themselves unlucky the truth is that the lack of damage output and speed control as well as the slow pace of the games makes these defensive setup teams inherently very risky to use maybe you're wondering why is it such a bad thing if defensive pokemon are the best please tell me oh bearded one fear not beloved viewer it's worth noting that some of this is subjective and there probably are people out there who would like pokemon more if it were more defense oriented in my opinion however it would be worse to understand why let's take a look at single battles in single battles defensive pokemon are far better the reason is basically because there's only one pokemon on the field at a time it doesn't matter if your defensive behemoth isn't immediately threatening any damage if they also aren't taking any the reason pokemon like skarmory chansey and toxapex aren't very good in competitive pokemon is because they can be ignored very easily because their strengths are defensive and not offensive you can basically play a two versus one by focusing on their partners and then finish them off once all their friends have been knocked out this obviously isn't the case in single battles to me one of my least favorite aspects of single battles is how defensive and stally they can be it isn't fun to play a 100 turn game where half those turns are switching between your gliscor and toxapex or to be slowly choked out via entry hazards as your opponent alternates between skarmory and chansey it's also very frustrating to be met with a defensive pokemon that you simply can't deal with and to lose a war of attrition over the long course of a battle without ever feeling like you have a fair shot obviously this isn't the only way to play singles but it has been a popular and successful strategy since i started playing pokemon competitively in generation 5. increasing the viability of stall teams in competitive pokemon is in my opinion a bad thing these teams are uninteractive take forever to win or lose and overall just aren't fun to play against or watch moreover a lot of the risk they have to take is about how long they dare to set up and slow play while knowing every turn they take is another opportunity to get crit at the moment this style of team rarely performs well because they're so susceptible to critical hits no more crits means more success for these teams means more people want to use teams of this style which could potentially lead to an incredibly slow grindy metagame that isn't fun to play against or watch this is why i feel that critical hits are a necessary evil pokemon is at its best when a mix between offensive and defensive teams are viable and messing with the balance in either direction leads to games either being too short and volatile or too slow and grindy critical hits aren't the mechanic we deserve but they are the mechanic we need